Hi, it's Matt Thomas here from King and Eagle, back with Sonic Academy, and today we're going to look at how one of the most underrated and indeed most influential synth companies of the 80s went from this to this via a man in a pyramid over a river with one of the world's most powerful synthesizers in just five years. So we're going to look at Casio and their history. They were actually called Casio when they started. It was uh, 1946 and the eldest of four brothers, a guy called Tadao, formed the Casio company. Now his younger brother Toshio ended up being the company's main ideas guy. The first thing that Toshio came up with was a thing called a smoking ring, which let you have a cigarette, clip it into a little ring on your finger and smoke it right the way down to the very end without burning your hand. Reason for this was that in post-war Tokyo, tobacco was in ridiculously short supply. So while this might seem a bit of a niche product, in that situation it sold pretty well. So the Casio brothers had the money to start looking into other products. What they decided to get into was calculating machines. Now at the time, a calculating machine was typically like electric, possibly a motor-driven thing, sometimes even hand-cranked, full of gears and really noisy uh, mechanical objects. So a decade of research and development followed, at the end of which the company rebranded as the Casio Computing Company and released the Casio 14A Compact Calculating Machine. Now when we say compact, it was about the same size as the desk in front of me. So this was a calculator that came built into a piece of furniture, so we're not talking compact the way you and I mean compact. It was uh, another good 15 years or so until 1972 before uh, the Casio brothers brought out uh, the Casio Mini, which was their first pocket calculator, and then in 1974, the wonderfully named Casio Tron, which was uh, their first Casio watch. Now, Toshio, the main designer, was looking around for other areas that the company could expand into. At the time, the Japanese consumer market was moving towards sort of lifestyle goods, things that made you sort of happier and more fulfilled. So he, being a musician himself, considered that maybe keyboards and electronic instruments was the way to go. So the first Casio musical instrument appeared in 1979 and I have it here in my hand, yes. This, this fine entity is the Casio Melody 80. And uh, you can at the deft press of a button, if you press the right button first, play music on it. Uh, I will endeavor to play you a tune on the Melody 80. Hold tight folks, here we go. Yes! So yeah, um, you could play Kraftwerk on it. And Kraftwerk did, because as well as the MLD80, there was a scientific calculator version called the FX501P. So Kraftwerk used the FX501P on their track Pocket Calculator. It's hard for us to look back at something like the MLD80, which, you know, has one sound and see it as very dramatically innovative. However, if you think back at the time, in terms of handheld portable electronic instruments, there wasn't much beside the stylophone. And as well as letting you tap notes out, you could also play them back. So it had a very simple sequencer as well. So all this, at the time, made it quite innovative, and it wasn't going to displace anybody's Moog modular, but it was a huge jump forward in its own way. Kraftwerk was certainly impressed enough that they partnered with Casio to make a Kraftwerk branded calculator, which if you went to their shows, you could buy from their merchandise store. These things came with a little book which showed you how to play lots of Kraftwerk hits, which numbers to press, so really quite a groovy item. If you can find one, I mean, good luck to you, I've never seen one on eBay, and if it does, you can look to be spending thousands and thousands and thousands. Now, while the musical calculators were all good fun, they're ultimately a bit of a footnote in the history of Casio. What came next was probably the most successful brand range of synthesizers in electronic music history, which was the Casio Tone keyboards. The first of all was the Casio Tone 201. This came out in January 1980 and it was 8-note polyphonic, it was a preset digital synthesizer, and it used a sound generation method called vowel consonant synthesis. Now while they're often dismissed as you know, home keyboards by serious musos, 
The Casio Tones frequently included quite groundbreaking features. The Casio Tone 701 included an electronic barcode reader, a sort of light pen thing, which uh, could scan in tune to an accompanying songbook. And then once the sort of tunes were into your 701, it would light up LEDs above the keys to show you which ones to press to play the melody. That's quite impressive. I don't know what you were doing in 1981, but I certainly wasn't scanning computer barcodes into my synthesizer. Bear in mind, 1981, I had a piano that was about as good as it got. And nor was I being instructed by that piano on how to play things, with or without LEDs. You know, it's, what is it now? It's another 30, 40 years since that. I still get a little bit excited about scanning QR codes. Somebody in 1981, with a light pen, like you know, the sort of thing you only got on a fair light at the time, in their house going squiddly diddly diddly do and then the thing goes blur yeah now your keyboard can play anything that's kind of cool it must have felt like a sort of rift opening up in time and space as well as the synthesizer capabilities of course these things began to add electronic drums some of which had their own fantastically quirky charm none more so of course than the earth shattering universe shaking casio vl1 Yeah, this is it. This is when Cassius began selling like hotcakes, selling hotcakes. The VL1 was almost a reversal of the musical calculator idea. In this case, you got a synthesizer with a calculator built in. It was a simple affair, presets, drum beats, a basic sequencer, but it had its own speaker system, it was portable, and it cost $70. Most famously, it was used by a band called Trio to make the record Da Da Da, that was a worldwide hit, and also featured on records by The Human League, Devo, Beastie Boys, Talking Heads, and of course, most importantly, and the reason we're all here, Venga Boys. Oh, yes. So this brings us up to 1982. Now, around about this time, a guy called Masanori Ishibashi, a Casio employee, puts in a patent for a thing called phase distortion synthesis. And this is the first rumblings of Casio's attempts to break into the pro synthesis market. But rather than starting small, Casio going big. And I mean big. Behold! The Cosmo Synthesizer. Behold! The Symphony Tron 8000. Behold! The Casio Pyramid of Synth. And, just to remind you, four years earlier, that was as good as things got. So yeah, Casio came out with all guns blazing. What was the Casio Cosmo synthesizer? So in the first half of the 80s, there were a number of Rolls-Royce sampling and synthesis systems around. These were the Fairlight, the Synclavier, and to an extent even the Emulator fell under this category. Nobody else was producing sampling at this point. It was an unaffordable luxury of the rich. So Casio thought, we'll have some of that. And they produced this Cosmo synthesizer. The, the full system would have cost about 30,000 pounds. The components of the system were one of Casio's own FP6000S computers, along with like a monitor and mouse, etc., to control it, and a light pen, much as with the, uh, the Fairlight. A Casio Tone 6000 velocity and pressure sensitive controller keyboard, two SPU units standing for sample playback, and six PDU units. These were PD phase distortion, as mentioned just before. Now, each one of these phase distortion units was probably equivalent to what later became a Casio CZ synth. So what we're looking at is approximately six polyphonic synthesizers and two polyphonic samplers, all racked up together, controlled from a computer and a keyboard. This does put it in pretty much the same league as things like the Fairlight at this time. So who is this for if it wasn't for the average punter? Enter the least average punter of all time. Isao Tomita was a pioneer synthesist who had produced electronic versions of classical music in the same vein as, say, Wendy Carlos, and was quite a huge star in Japan as a result. The Cosmo synthesizer was given to and developed with him by Casio. Now, when I get a new synthesizer, I mean, obviously, you know, I like to kind of see what it can do and uh, pull up some interesting waveforms, uh, maybe, you know, see what the sawtooths are like. Now, when Tamita got his hands on the Cosmo, the first thing he did was use the light pen to draw waveforms into it using the wavelengths of stars and constellations that have been recorded by NASA. 
So as I say, this was the right guy for a particularly flexible synthesizer at the time. He was to use the Cosmo synthesizer for a number of events over the coming years called Sound Clouds. At each of these events, Tamita was placed inside a gigantic Casio branded pyramid, a glass pyramid, which typically would be suspended above a body of water whilst barges and helicopters and nearby uh, buildings exploded with fireworks and lasers. So the Cosmo synthesizer did make a huge impact in its own way, but it was unfortunately only ever a prototype. However, it was to go on to become quite the influential synth in its own right. The, uh, the PDUs, the six phase distortion units inside it, each one equated to a Casio CZ. And in 1984, the Casio CZ101 hit the market. It's easy to overlook the impact the CZ101 made in the early 80s. It was cheap, it made, for the time, really quite a flexible and interesting bunch of sounds. And the synth sold bucket loads, I mean, absolute bucket loads. 80,000 CZ101s alone sold in the US, and the numerous CZ copies, the 1,000, the 3,000, the 5,000, adding full-size keys, more memories, more polyphony, etc. Casio CZ was a hugely popular synth at the time. And as for that takeover of the entire consumer market for electronic instruments, oh yeah, Casio had that going on. They didn't just sell synthesizers, they put synthesizers into everything they possibly could. They put them into boom boxes, they put them into radios, they put them into toasters. They didn't actually put them into toasters. But if you found a Casio toaster with a synthesizer in it, please let me know. The success of the CZs was followed by the million-selling SK-1 sampler, a tiny toy of a thing which brought sampling into an affordable range that had never even come close to previously. Sampling components of the Cosmo synthesizer eventually made it to the market as the FZ range of samplers, the first affordable 16-bit samplers on the market, used by none other than a certain Mr. Chris Agnew of Agnelli & Nelson. Finally, Casio released the VZ range of synths, these upgraded the basic CZ specs and capabilities, but ultimately weren't that popular. And at that point, Casio dropped out of the pro synth market for many years. In the last few years, Casio have returned to the pro market. Things like the XWPD1 Groovebox, one of which is upstairs in my son's bedroom as we speak. It's in the countless Casios to be found in the bedrooms and rehearsal rooms of people who go on to greater things that really Casio's chief legacy lies. But that's not to say they haven't been used by some huge names. Hot Chip, Blondie, Goldie, Jean-Michel Jarre, Moby, Pulp, The Cars, D-Lights, Stevie Wonder, White Town, Ortecra, Portishead, Blur, Beck, Fatboy Slim and even Nine Inch Nails have all found a use for a Casio at some time or other. If you should ever find yourself over in Tokyo and you have some spare time to get across to Setagaya, the Toshio Casio Museum hosts some of the key instruments from Casio's history, including on occasion the Cosmo synthesizer itself. So there, in a nutshell, is the history of Casio. There'll be far more to talk about, but I think it's time we moved on to learning about the CZ itself. So, I will leave you now. I am going to quickly grow a beard and put a jumper on, and I'll see you in the next chapter. Thanks everybody for watching, commenting, and indeed liking. We really do appreciate all the support we get here on our Sonic Academy YouTube channel. So if you find this video super useful, please, we'd love you to hit the subscribe button. We update the uh, YouTube channel every week with new content. And if you want to watch some more relevant content, just click on the videos beside me.